Look at the frame. Completely different. The most important person in the room just referred to you as an expert and an authority in the area. See that difference. As a member in the boardroom, it's not how much you speak, it's what you say that can. Welcome to Life of a CISO. I'm Dr. Eric Cole, your host, and we'll be taking you on a journey each week on what it takes to be a CISO and what are solutions that you can implement today if you are currently a Chief Information Security Officer or if you want to be one in the future. This is Life of a CISO. Welcome, 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 welcome. You know what time it is. Dr. E is here and it's time for Life of a CISO. What's up? Right? I actually had to restart this one because I actually started it with, what's up? And I realized that's breaking my signature move, right? I didn't know it was my signature move. I never intended it to be my signature move, but it's become my signature move, right? Which is uh, welcome, 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 right? I, I get on the call with new clients or I meet people at events and they come up to me, welcome, welcome. And I'm like, okay, you listen to my podcast, right? So you got to always be careful of your actions because they become habits and then they become signature moves. So you want to make sure that uh, you're deliberate in doing that. So if you're a first time listener, welcome. Where have you been? And I know we got a lot of repeat listeners. So I always appreciate you giving me 30 minutes of your time and welcome back. As always, I love giving back to the community. So these are free resources that I'll always do. And then at 9.30 a.m. East Coast every Thursday morning, I do a YouTube live where you can interact with me, ask questions, and uh, like get real-time information that you need to solve any problems you have. So those will always be free. But if you wanna accelerate, if you wanna get to that next level, and you want to either do some group coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching, you want to go into our paid CISO cert, that's going to get you where you want to go six months or less. Really quick, really fast. So if you're ready to accelerate, you want to go in and contact us, either secure-anchor.com CISO or e-call at secure-anchor.com. Get you there a lot quicker and a lot faster. The key thing of being world-class is always improving is always getting better, and here's the trick. If you go in and look at people that you consider world-class, whether you go in and you go the business side and you wanna go with a Jeff Bezos or Mark Cuban, or you wanna go Oprah Winfrey, one of my favorite people, amazing person, or you wanna go with Tom Brady or Michael Jordan or whoever it is, right? What makes them world-class is how they utilize their time. Prioritization. Because guess what? Every human on this planet gets 24 hours in a day. And every one of us gets seven days in a week. And everyone except for leap year, right, gets 365 days a year. That's the equalizer. Nobody gets more Nobody gets less. So the question is, how are you going to utilize and prioritize your time? And here's the problem. Just being honest with you, most CISOs don't do a good job. When I start talking to most CISOs, one of the first things I always get existing CISOs. So we're going to switch. I know we talk a lot about people that want to become a CISO. Existing CISOs, what I get more time than not is Eric, I hear what you're telling me to do, but I don't have any time. I spend my entire day firefighting. I show up in the morning and I have good intentions. I plan on doing these three things today and fires hit. And the next thing I know, it's 7.30 p.m. I'm tired, I'm late to my kid's game and I leave. And I didn't accomplish any of those three items. And this is where it gets hard because I look at them and say, you realize that was a decision that you made. You decided not to get those three things done. 
And depending on where they're at, in what I call sort of the uh, responsibility scale, right? I sometimes get some interesting reactions, right? Because, uh, Eric, you have not... Listen, you made a decision. And, and we need to recognize that that's the beginning. At 9 o'clock this morning, you could have said no to the fire. You could have said it was more important, and you could have focused and got one of your items done. But whether you consciously or unconsciously, knowing or unknowing... You decided not to do that. And until you start accepting and recognizing, we're going to go deep here. Some people can get this, some people can't, but I think you can handle it. Until you recognize the reality, which is a world-class CISO knows one thing, and that is they are 100% responsible for what happens. Everything that happens during the day, and in their life, they are 100% responsible for. Which means they get to decide how to use their time. They get to decide what to do and what not to do. Now, I always love pushing this where they go and say, Eric, you don't get it. I have to put out all these fires. I say, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had a situation where an emergency happened? Something happened to your kid and you had to leave work and you had to take him to the emergency room or you had to take him on a trip or uh, you had to take a personal day off and you didn't show up to work. Did that ever happen? They said, yes. I said, and what happened to the fires? Did, did the place burn down? And they sort of look at me and they get a, either happy or annoyed depending on where they are on that maturity scale. And they're sort of like, well, no. Oh, so if on a day, unplanned, you're not there for four hours, somehow the fires get resolved, right? Somehow it gets fixed without you there because the place didn't burn down. So if that can happen and that's true, why can't you control that? Why can't you decide... For four hours today, I'm going to do something different. Or for four hours today, I'm not going to focus on that given area. So we need to recognize that if you're firefighting, it's because you decided that's a priority. So this is one of my favorite stories. It's what I live by. And it's, I have a lot of books that changed my life, but this is one of the key ones. And it's called, Will It Make Your Boat Go Faster? And I haven't talked about it in a while, so I'll, I'll cover the story with you if you haven't heard it before. If you did, it's a great story. So just sit back, smile, and enjoy the ride. But it's really how I live my life. I get up in the morning, and I schedule out my entire day, and I look at each item and say, will it help my boat go faster? Essentially, will it help me get closer to my goals and dreams? Will it help me achieve what I ultimately want? Now, let me explain where this came from. Preparing for the 2000 Olympics in Sydney, Australia, the British rowing team made an interesting decision. In the past, they used to have people try out for different events. The one person, the two, the four, the eight person boats. Now, I know I'm always corrected here where people go, I think if it's one person, it's called sculling. And if it's more than one, it's called crew. And Forest through the trees, right? Stick with me here. Go with the story, right? Go, go with the story here. So instead of doing that where they had all the participants who wanted to be in the Olympics try out for individual events, instead what they did is they said, okay, we're going to have everybody compete in the single-person boat. Everybody then, we're going to rank order your times. The fastest, get the single. The next fastest get the double, the next fastest get the four, and then the, the next fastest or the slowest, right, of the qualifiers basically get put in the eight-person boat. So you can imagine that the folks who are in the eight-person boat have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder, right? They weren't the fastest. Yes, they made the Olympic team, 
but they were sort of on the bottom of the ranking order. So you could tell they had a little bit of an attitude going in, which is a good thing to have. All right, so they sat down two years before the Olympics, and they said, what is our goal and objective? Their goal and objective was not to win a medal. Their goal and objective was simple, to win gold. Silver meant they failed, and bronze meant they failed. It was gold or it was bust. That's what they decided. That was the only possible outcome from the Sydney Olympics. So they then said, okay, if we want to win gold, what must we become obsessed with? What must drive everything we do? And they said, well, to win gold, we must be the fastest boat on the water. Whichever boat is the fastest wins gold. So it's pretty, pretty obvious here. So they then made a very interesting decision. For the next two years, every decision they make would be driven by a simple question. Will it make the boat go faster? So let's play this out. It's the end of the day, it's a Friday, and some of your friends wanna go grab some alcoholic beverages. Will drinking alcohol make the boat go faster? No. Now, I'm not saying it's going to make you go slower, but it definitely having some alcohol in your system is not going to be an asset that is proven to make your boat go faster. So what do you say? No. Will waking up at 5 a.m. and doing cardio for two hours make the boat go faster? Yes. So we do it. Will having pizza for lunch make the boat go faster? No, so we don't do it. Will drinking water and staying hydrated help the boat go faster? Yes, so we do it. So you, you get the idea here. Now, some people push back and go, but Eric, you're missing the point of life, which is you're supposed to have fun. And I'm like, no, you're missing the point which is, that's now your objective. So yes, if your goal in life is to have fun, if you go and say, my goal and objective for the next 12 months is to have fun, then yes, you answer those questions differently. Should I go have drinks with friends? Yes, because you have fun when you do that. Should you get up at 5 a.m.? No, because that's not fun to you. Should you have pizza for lunch? Yes, because that's fun and you enjoy it. But it's a completely different goal and objective. And you need to recognize and own that that's what you're focused on. But if you're focused on being a world-class CISO, that's quite different. Now, they did two years. Every decision they made was focused on will it make their boat go faster? I highly recommend you read the book. I paraphrased it. They go into more details. If I said anything that contradicted what was in the book, go with the book, right? I'm just trying to give you the story. Now, of course, I'm gonna be a spoiler alert. I think we all know they won gold. Because let's face it, if they didn't win gold, it'd be a really bad story, right? It would be a really bad motivational tool for me where I go through all of this telling you how important it is, and then they fail, right? So no, they, they actually did win gold, right? Which, which makes the story that much better. So here's the question. I'm not going to say two years. I'm not going to say 18 months. I'm not going to even say 12 months. Let's start with nine months. How committed are you to being a world-class CISO? Is it worth focused attention for nine months? If I tell you that if you focused on will it make your boat go faster, which is really will it make you a world-class CISO, and I use that phrase generically in my life, but I know what it means. So if you ask the question for nine months, 
everything you did in your life was driven. Will it make you a world-class CISO? Can you just see the impact? Could you see the changes it would have? So I always go back and ask you, how committed are you? You tell me you want to be a world-class CISO, but you're not willing to give up TV in the evening to read business books. To me, you're really not that committed. You could do it, but you're deciding not to. So interesting perspective. I just want you to put a little time into that. One of the things I often do when I do the group coaching or I work with folks who do Q&A, and they always go, but Eric, I'm tired. You decided to be tired. You, would, you were awake enough to watch TV for three hours, but you tell me you weren't awake enough to listen to an audiobook or read. Wait a second. How is listening to an audiobook any different than listening to TV? How is watching a video on business any different than watching TV? Same thing. But, but Eric, I'm tired. Yeah, but you're going to absorb some of it, not all of it. So one of the things I often say to folks, and it's going to sound weird, but let me explain it. When it comes to your career, when it comes to being a world-class CISO, when it comes to your life, are you a chicken or a pig? You're probably all like, what? Where, where did that come from? Here's the analogy. I, I always do it backwards on purpose because it's more fun. I got your attention and now you're like, where is he going with this? When you make breakfast in the morning and you make bacon and eggs, the chicken is involved, the pig is committed. Right? So when you make bacon and eggs, right, the pig basically is all in. It gives up its life. Right? You can't make bacon without essentially killing the pig. It's fully committed. It's all in. However, the chicken can make an egg and still live. Right? I know crazy example, but you sort of get the point there. So the point is a chicken is involved, a pig is committed. So are you just involved with your life and being a world-class CISO because it's convenient? Or are you fully committed? And if you're fully committed, why wouldn't you let everything be driven by will it make me a world-class CISO for nine months? Now, nine months will absolutely get you there. But if you're like, no way, no way. What if we went in and we did a shorter period? I'm going to steal something from a friend of mine is some of you might have heard of 75 hard. 75 hard is an interesting concept developed by a great entrepreneur, motivational speaker. And essentially, what he says is for 75 days, you need to do some simple things. You need to exercise twice a day, one time outside. You need to be on a diet. You need to take a picture and you need to read. Simple, simple things. And essentially, the way it works is pretty cool. You have to do that for 75 days if you miss a day. So let's say day 50, you forget to take a picture. Or day 50, you forget to read, you start back at zero. You have to have 75 consecutive days. Now, people like this because they get healthy, they lose weight, they get in shape. But really what it's teaching you is discipline and focus. What he's really saying is for 75 days, you're going to let everything be driven by these four areas. So what if we do our own version? Instead of nine months, what if for 75 days, you just asked yourself, will it help me become a world-class SO? 75 days is two and a half months. For two and a half months, that's not even a quarter. That's not even a quarter of the year. What if you decided to make your career and your life a priority? Everything would change if you just did it for 75 days. I don't give marriage advice. I'm the last person to give marriage advice. But if people are struggling in a relationship, I give them a simple challenge. 
what if for 75 days you made the other person think they were the most important most important person to you? What if you did that? You're telling me that that wouldn't change your relationship? You're telling me that wouldn't change everything? So it's all about prioritization. And by the way, there's a reason you pick 75 because that's typically the amount of time it takes for habit to be built. So that, that's where that 75 days come from. Some people say 60, some say 80, but about 75 days is how long it takes for a habit to get built. So here's the coolest part. It's not two years, it's not a year, it's not even nine months. Now, I purposely started that way psychologically because now 75 days seems easy when I was pushing nine months, right? So the point is, now if you go in and you say for 75 days, everything I do is gonna be driven, will it make me a world-class SO? What's gonna happen? The habit will be built and you'll do it for a longer period. And those are the folks that excel in their careers. So if you want to be world-class, start making your career a priority. Now, the other thing I want to cover, because I get a lot of questions on, is how do you show up in the boardroom? How do you go in and show up as a true executive, a C-level, and actually have a seat at the table and be invited back? Because let's face it, the biggest problems with CISO is they're not invited to the table and when they are, and they get called up to the adult table, they get demoted back to the kids' table pretty quick. They don't get invited back. Couple of easy tricks. Super easy tricks. You are being judged first impressions. How you show up, people are gonna make an interpretation. Just so we're clear. I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I don't believe it. I don't think it's correct, but it happens. The reality is this. And the point of it is a lot of world-class security engineers that become CISOs think it's cool to wear T-shirts and shorts, right, or dress weird or be a little different or stand out from the crowd. Like I said, I'm not here to judge. I'm telling you the secret. If you want to be respected when you walk in the boardroom, you need to wear a button down and a jacket and a professional suit. Right? Male or female, there's professional suits for both. Right? So I use that in a generic term. But you need to blend in with everyone else. When you're in a boardroom, you do not want to stick out. And I coach folks, and we show up to the board meeting, and the CISO shows up, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Right? That they're wearing the, the wild t-shirt and the whatever jeans. And, and I'm like, dude, did you not listen? Eric, I'm unique and different. And if people aren't going to accept me for who I am, then I don't care. Great. Have a nice day and I leave. And they're like, where are you going? I'm like, you just told me you don't want to be a executive. And they're like, no, I do, but I don't care what people think and I'm going to be unique and different. Those are contradictory. Unfortunately, if you want to be viewed as a professional, you need to show up as a professional. And this is an area that I'm often called out on, but a lot of people thank me because guess what? Nobody wants to talk about this side. Everyone wants to talk about how smart and brilliant and great you are, but the point is, if you're showing up in the boardroom, you have to look a certain way. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not judging anybody. It's the reality. If you show up looking like an exec, you'll be treated like an exec. If you show up like you're going to a rock concert, you're going to be treated respectively. So you need to understand that if you want to be unique and different, and you don't care what other people think, and you don't put on a suit, and you want to wear your t-shirt, and you want to wear your ripped jeans, that's cool, but you're probably not going to be a world-class CISO. It's not going to happen. Now, I always get folks come back, but Eric, so-and-so, who's the best-known security person in the world, 
shows up to board meetings in T-shirts, sneakers, and jeans. Or I get Steve Jobs a lot. Steve Jobs used to show up in his uh, turtleneck and his jeans and his sneakers. Yes. But can I be honest with you? You're not Steve Jobs. And if you are Steve Jobs, you can get away with that, right? So I'm just helping you out here. Like I said, I talk about the things no one else wants to talk about because it's the reality. You need to fit in. Next, and this is another big one. When you're a world-class security engineer and you get called into a meeting, you are often the smartest person in the room when it comes to technology. So everyone's going to look towards you for that knowledge and expertise. When you walk in a boardroom from a business standpoint, which is why you're there, you are not the smartest person in the room when it comes to business. In a lot of cases, you actually might be the least. You need to own that and accept that and check your ego out the door. Next piece of advice. It is better for somebody to call on you and present you as an expert than for you to force it on everyone and have them draw the wrong conclusion. One of the big mistakes I see is when a CISO is in a boardroom for the first time, they think that by talking, interrupting, or putting in information outside of their comfort zone is going to help them, it's gonna hurt them. When I go to meetings as a CISO for a company, I don't talk that much. I listen a lot. If it goes into an area that I can address, I do cover, but most of the time I wait for somebody to call me and go, Eric, I know this is an area you have expertise in. Why don't you give us some opinions? Now watch. If I'm in the boardroom and the other members don't really know who I am and I start talking and it's not correct or accurate, they're going to judge me and I'm going to be pushed out. But if I wait for the CEO that everyone respects and knows to go, Dr. Cole, you're an expert in this area and you've helped me before. Could you give us a little insight? Look at the frame. Completely different. The most important person in the room just referred to you as an expert and an authority in the area. See that difference. As a member in the boardroom, it's not how much you speak. It's what you say that counts. So this idea with world-class security engineers, if whoever speaks the most wins, doesn't count here. You want to speak a little, but be authoritative. Next trick. Always ask questions if you're not sure. So if somebody says, Dr. Cole, can you give us your opinion on some of the things we should do from a security standpoint since we were just hit with this attack? And say, okay. I just want to ask a few questions. From an executive level, did this have a financial impact on the company? Yes or no? Simple questions, but it's, it's getting data and showing your authority. From a business perspective, now you don't always have to say that, but because you're often viewed as the techie, if you don't qualify your question, they're going to assume it's coming from a technical standpoint. So you don't want to overdo it, but saying from a business standpoint and ask a revenue or profit, a money type question is not only going to give you information or data that you need. You don't want to just ask silly questions. It, it actually is to help you, but it's also showing authority. They're going to go, wow, this isn't an Uber geek. This is actually a business person. He understands his first question was, did this have a financial impact on the company? That's a pretty good question. That's a really good question. All right, so it's going in and setting the stage. And then the other key thing is get to know the people in the room and start building up alliances. So when I go in and I'm invited to board meetings, I usually like to get there a little early, and especially if I'm new, as my first time at the seat at the table, 
I'm going to go over and introduce myself. Hi, I'm Eric. Uh, I just wanted to introduce. Oh, you're so okay. So, so where do you? Oh, you're the finance, blah blah. blah. And and then just build that conversation and rapport with those folks. You don't want to be that stranger. And then most important, do not call people out or disagree with them until you are a respected member of the team. I've seen this happen all the time and they crash and burn. So the CISO sitting in the meeting and they see the CEO and CFO who have worked together for 15 years and have the most respect for each other that anyone could have start arguing or disagreeing. Then somebody else in the meeting says something and the CISO is like, oh, I'm going to show who I am. And they go, I just have to step in here and say, I completely disagree with what that person said. You're done. Because you didn't earn that level of respect to go there. Now, I was going to ask from CISOs, what if somebody says something that is technically wrong? And here's my advice if you're a brand new CISO. If it's significantly wrong and it's at a level that somebody could die. Like, like it, it's, it's a piece of data that they're making a decision on that if they continue on this false data, people will get hurt and there'll be significant damage. Yes, you do need to step in and say, listen, I, I just want to add clarification. I think the correct information is here. But if somebody says something that's not technically correct, and it's not significant. It's not really going to change anything. It's not really going to negatively impact in a really bad way. Don't say anything. It's not worth the burn, the bridge. And then finally, as we start to wrap up, my number one advice is before you have an actual seat at the table and you're a participant, see if you can sit in. I would right now, if you're a deputy or even a brand new CISO and you're not invited, I would ask the executive, listen, I'm going to sit on the outside chairs. By the way, if you've ever been to a board meeting or board of directors, there's the table that the active participants sit on, and then there's chairs around the outside, and that's where the support people are that basically can hand information or data, but they're not speaking. That's, you want to be in that seat a couple times before you're at the table. Because if you've never been in a boardroom, it's interesting dynamics. You need to understand and know the dynamics as an observer before you become a participant. So my number one tasking for you is whether you're a CISO or deputy CISO, uh, a junior engineer, or you want to be a CISO in the future, ask, can I attend a meeting? I just want to be an observer. I'm just curious what happens in board meetings. I was wondering if I can attend as an observer. Worst case scenario, they say no. Best case scenario, they say yes, but here's the trick. You never know unless you ask. So don't be afraid to ask. And remember, if you want to have a seat at the table, you need to blend in, be professional, and add value, not start trouble or get people mad. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Life of a CISO, and we'll see you next week.